Hey guys, I'm George, the CEO and co-founder here with Real Vision. No, 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 that's not right. Sorry, I'm getting confused. Hey guys, I'm George, the GM of memberships and experiences here at Real Vision. So as you might have seen, we've been very busy over the last few months. We uh, hosted two massive uh, virtual experiences, the crypto gathering at the start of the summer and more recently the, the festival of learning. And then in between those two, we also built out a dedicated editorial team focused on crypto uh, as we were building out that new crypto tier that we just launched internally as well. Uh, if you haven't seen it, please take a look. And then lastly, more recently, we, uh, we launched the exchange, which is the, the private network for all of you, the members, our guests and contributors, as well as us, the you know, staff of Real Vision, you know, the people who are building this, this service. So if you haven't actually joined the exchange, please, please do so. Uh, you can find it somewhere here in the navigation bar of the, of the website that is. Please go in there, start engaging with other members, start asking questions, responding to questions, writing your research, filming yourself. Uh, please go to the how I, how I use Real Vision section and just take a look at who the other members are, where they come from, what their background is, and share your story. Let us know. That's how we get to know each other and that's how we start developing deeper and deeper relationships. So as you can see, there is lots happening in Real Vision and a shit ton really as Ryan likes to say happening in markets as well so we want to make sure that everyone follows that journey and no one is uh, left behind not understanding uh, what's going on because it tends to get a little bit intimidating sometimes I mean we've all been there when I was a subscriber I remember some of those interviews one hour interview would take me five hours really to watch uh, you know I'd stop every five minutes google something open the CFA books start from options, then move to fixed income, then go to equity, just, just to piece the puzzle together, because some of those interviews go very deep into the rabbit hole. I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the wrong, let's do this, let's, let's continue. All right. So education really is gonna be this big theme going forward here at Real Vision, and uh, myself and the team have big, big ideas and plans for the future that we're gonna flesh out over the coming months. And as part of that, you know, step one, I'm here, I'm happy to announce uh, what we're gonna do with Steven Van Meter, who basically what he's gonna do is take a video from the platform every week and break it down into the core concepts and themes being discussed and, and give his opinion and his thoughts, where he stands on some of those topics. That is then gonna be a format for the exchange. That's where the show is gonna live and we will be able to you know, ask Steven more questions and go deeper into some of those topics with him and he will uh, engage there. He, he'll be very uh, active on the exchange. The The first few episodes are going to be posted uh, on the platform just so people understand what this is and uh, where it's going to live and then after that we're going to move everything to the exchange. So please uh, share your feedback, uh, what you like, what you don't like. Both Steven, myself and the team were very very interested in learning what you think about this so we can iterate and make it better and better. Same as the daily briefing, that's how it started. We launched something and then made it better and better and better over time, iterating every week. But please do me this uh, one favor. When you're watching it, just consider, consider a, a new member that is not as experienced in markets as you might be and consider how this could help them go on the journey with us and understand some of those topics and how they relate to their life and their context and how they can basically benefit from every everything that we are so accustomed to here. Hi, I'm Ral Pal. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1 to get a month's access to this incredible treasure trove. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Here on Real Vision. So just a caveat, have it in mind and really looking forward to your feedback. Uh, that's it from me. It's, it's, this is take 95. I've had three glasses of rum, so I'm done. 
Over to Stephen. Enjoy. See you on the exchange. Ciao. Hi, I'm Steve Van Meter, Macro Fund Manager and Inventor of Portfolio Shield. I am very excited to announce to you today that Real Vision and I have entered a partnership where I'll post a weekly video on the exchange. Now the concept, the concept is really simple. I'll review one video from Real Vision each week and break it down to help you understand the difficult concepts and open a conversation so you can get the most out of your Real Vision subscription. Now with our inaugural video, I'm very excited that we're going to be reviewing Rob Powell's Has Everything Changed? video where he goes into his unfolding thesis. And I wanna share with you some of the big picture views and kind of dig deeper into the data so you can find out how you can interpret it on your own. So he starts out by talking about his three-part thesis. This is really important. Most macro managers will break down their long-term thesis. So when you hear macro think many years into three different parts and then oftentimes they'll break down those segments into separate parts as well. And he has three phases, the liquidation, hope, and insolvency phase. Now we've gone through the liquidation phase already. That was March. And when you saw this big sell off in March, what happened? People were liquidating their positions. Now, why did that occur? Well, it occurred because there was a dollar shortage and we knew this in advance. Now, there's really no way to predict that this saw or when this off was going to happen, but we knew it was going to happen because the repo market told us. Now, I'm pulling a chart from the Federal Reserve database, and you can look this up. It's called Assets Other Repurchase Agreements at the Wednesday level, and you can see that when repurchase agreements start to rise, it tells you that there is a problem in the monetary system. It tells you the system is fracturing or breaking. And we can zoom in a little bit so you can see this. Now, what is a repurchase agreement? Well, it's simply a short-term dollar loan. So it's where the Fed will go to, say, the European Central Bank or any other central bank who needs dollars and do a currency swap. Now, the swap isn't permanent. It is a loan, and they can range as short as, say, seven days to a month or more, depending on what the Fed offers. The idea is those loans must be paid back with dollars. That's real key. So the Fed came in and they you know, just pumped the market full of these dollar loans. And this was the Fed bringing the fire hose to the rescue. They injected liquidity. Now there's a big misunderstanding because the Fed always also did quantitative easing. And as Brent and I talked about in, in our interview on Real Vision a few weeks back, quantitative easing doesn't add liquidity. And Raul didn't say that in his interview, he was very clear, it was these repurchase or what we call repo loans. Now, if we move on to the hope phase, so the first phase in his view is past. Now, the, I'm, I'm gonna share with you the hope phase, but understand that underneath this, the third phase is actually starting to build. Now, the hope phase is, you know, the worst is already behind us. Now, and, and many of us have had things go wrong in our lives and, and probably will in the future. And, and there's a point where it's like, well, okay, things can't get worse than this. I mean, how can they? And that's really where hope steps in. It's like, look, if I can get through this worst possible event, then the rest is all downhill. And the idea here now from an investment standpoint is the Fed's got your back. They're going to protect you. They're going to take care of you. And so what did investors do? They went back to their risk-taking ways and they bid tech stocks higher and they shorted the bond market and they did everything they could to say, hey, I believe the Fed's got me for the first time in history. The Fed is going to make this work and I can take all the risk I want now and not worry. That is the hope phase because I'm going to get in front of this trend before the economy takes off and then I'm going to get, you know, make a lot of money. That's the hope phase. Now, underneath the hope phase is the insolvency phase that we're going to spend most of our time talking about uh, as we break down what Rao's view was here. Now, what is an insolvency phase? It means the worst is yet to come. And insolvency is really simple. It means you're unable to pay your debts. Or there's lots of people 
the, the, the bigger the insolvency phase, the more people who can't pay their debts. And that is very important to understand. So defaults start to rise. They just creep up, creep, creep, creep. And then all of a sudden, boom, they explode higher. Now, what's been going on, see, we've had this whole phase, but underneath the whole phase, as it's been moving through, the insolvency phase is there. It's just really small. We can't see it if we don't want to. But if you look out in your own community, are you seeing businesses fail? Sure. That is part of the insolvency phase. And many people say, well, it was just a pandemic. You know, there'll be other businesses that will come in and replace them. Believe me, it's the beginning of a trend. It's the beginning. So this is, again, all due to a dollar shortage. There just isn't enough dollars in the global economy. The Fed doesn't have the ability to create dollars. Again, as Brent and I talked about through quantitative easing. See, everybody sees quantitative easing as a big spigot that the Fed has to create dollars, and they can't. The Fed has no mechanism to create dollars. All they can do is encourage people to borrow money. Now, why does that matter? Because money is created in our financial system when people borrow. Again, the Fed can't create it. The Fed, All the Fed can do is lend, not spend, as Powell has been very clear about. So how does the Fed lend? Well, they do it through their dollar swap lines or repo loans. And that's about it. Quantitative easing is just a means to lower interest rates. So the swap lines that the Fed put out there were really just a band-aid. They didn't really solve the problem at all. They were just a temporary patch on a bigger issue. Because again, all those had to be paid back and they have been. It doesn't mean that were more dollars were created from them putting these swap lines out. The Fed wishes it were true but it's not. Now, the market, of course, thinks the problem is solved. The reality is an insolvency phase, the problem actually never went away. People just, again, think, okay, well, it can't be worse than March because March was really bad. So, you know, if, if there is another drop in stock prices or if the economy contracts again, it certainly won't be that bad and I'll be okay. But this is where we turn to lending standards. And Rao pointed out that lending standards are really tight. Now, let me show you where you can find this information. It's at the Senior Loan Officer Survey, and it's posted on the Federal Reserve website. Now, the September data came out yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to fully review it, but I did look at the charts, and they weren't as cool as the charts that you can see right now. So let's pull the charts up for uh, July, the end of the second quarter, and you can see that lending standards for commercial and industrial loans were almost as tight as they were during the great financial crisis. What does that mean? Banks don't want to lend. Uh, how about we go down to uh, commercial real estate? Very, very tight. Again, banks don't want to lend. And how about residential mortgage loans? And again, banks are showing the second tightest in history where they don't want to lend. Now, you can also go to the Federal Reserve uh, database and they do have some of these charts, but they aren't, they don't have the full data. Now, the commercial industrial loans do, so you can see just how tight this is. And this is now as of the third quarter, so it actually got worse. And then I pulled the uh, residential or government mortgage loans, and this, while it is, is higher and has definitely increased from Q2, it data only goes back to 2015, whereas on these charts here, you can see it all the way back to, say, 1990. So the other thing that Rao mentioned, and, and why does tiny lending standards matter? Because in a debt-based economy, you need an expansion of debt. And right now, the banks are saying, look, you're not credit worthy, right? They're afraid that if they give people money in the loan, they won't come back. So they don't want to lend. And that is a big factor in the insolvency phase. Because if I can't pay on my debt, what do I need? I need to go borrow money so I can cover that loan until things get better. But if I can't borrow, well, the odds of me going into delinquency and default increase exponentially. And as more time passes, well, you get that insolvency phase starts out small. And as Ralph said, then happens all at once. Now, he also said he's been charting triple B equities 
And what did he mean by that? Well, he's looking at the credit rating and I wanna show you, he was looking at companies with a weak credit rating. Now, what is triple B? It's the worst rating of the investment grade space. So you can see the investment grade goes from triple B all the way up to triple A. Now, why is he interested in the triple B space? Because if these companies start having insolvency issues, they're going to get downgraded to junk. And that's what he is looking for. He's looking for them as a leading indicator in the market. And I think that is quite interesting. The last thing he mentioned kind of in his insolvency phase is, is this reference to musical chairs. And it's a really great example. Now we all understand how musical chairs work. Let's say we have 10 people and 10 chairs and they're sitting there. All of a sudden, everybody stands up one chair is moved, the music starts. And when the music stops, as everyone's circling the chairs, one person loses out. But in an insolvency phase, it's actually much worse than that because in actual musical chairs, your probability of getting a chair is depends on how fast you are and how fast you, how close you are to an open chair. In an insolvency phase, it doesn't work like that. So let's take a look at this from an insolvency perspective. You've got 10 chairs, 10 people or businesses. Everybody stands up. Five chairs get removed, right? Because remember, everybody's in trouble now because they're virtually insolvent. The music starts. They start going around. And now when the music stops, it's not who's closest to the chair wins. No, no, the rules are different. The five chairs are given to the five most credit worthy people in the game and the other people lose. That's why those lending standards matter. That's why those triple B ratings matter because those people who can't get loans and have a high probability of going into junk status or default, they're gonna get downgraded and they're going to make this insolvency phase blow apart just as we've seen in prior insolvency phase. Uh, uh, phases. Now, Raul does mention some risk and recovery, but I really wanna talk about his trades before we wrap up, because this seemed to be a real hot spot. And as someone who manages a macro fund, I totally, totally get where he's coming from. Now, Rao recommended Bitcoin and gold. And a lot of people want to invest as he is, and that's wonderful. But they had a lot of questions and a lot of concerns. So let's understand Rao's view from a macro ma uh, investor, because macro means long term. And he was very clear that he has these positions and he's just going to hold on to them. He is not worried if they go down 5%, 20%, 50%. He, he is not concerned about that. He is not selling. And his risk tolerance may not be mine and it may not be yours. And that's really important to understand because many of the questions he got was, well, what if it goes down? And, and his answer was, look, if you're worried about it going down, then you need to reduce some of your exposure. Now, he's not worried. He's going to ride through whatever it is because he is very convicted about his research and data. And when you find someone from a macro perspective who not only shares with you their thesis or view and is willing to invest in it and stick through it, well, that tells you what his conviction level is. Now, for some of you who are looking at, you know, should I invest in Bitcoin or gold and you're not sure? Well, he did point out, look, you can always buy the dips. Because he, he's not saying that Bitcoin is just going to go straight up from here or gold is going to go straight up from here. The markets don't work like that. But he wanted, I think he wanted to be very clear that his risk tolerance is not your risk tolerance. You're welcome to join him because he's sharing with you his trades. But you should understand that you should invest towards your risk tolerance. And if it's too risky right now, back off your trades a little bit. If you're kind of looking at this or you have dry powder, buy the dips. He's just very happy with his view. Now, in terms of Bitcoin... He cites some very interesting views that he believes that as Bitcoin is made into a mainstream proc where more investors can buy it, that you'll see large pension funds, institutional money managers, hedge funds, uh, RIAs, people like myself who cannot actually buy it for their clients because it's not sold on the major exchanges. You'll see them coming into the picture. And he believes that in an insolvency phase, you, you, you will get either inflation or deflation. And mind you, right now he's on the deflation camp. And at some point we'll see deflation spin into inflation. But he believes in an insolvency phase, both Bitcoin and gold can do well. It doesn't mean they won't go down in the short term at all. Now, my view is I believe they actually will pull back in the short term because in an insolvency phase, what happens? People need money to pay their loans. So what do they do? They sell stuff at a discount. And they generally sell stuff that they can because it's liquid. Gold is very liquid. 
Bitcoin is not something I have a lot of experience with. I've never personally owned it, but it appears to be very liquid. You can go out and you can sell it. So it is possible there will be pullbacks in gold and silver in the shorter term over Rao's long-term macro thesis. And I totally agree with him. I believe that he's right. That and while I'm certainly not, my opinion is not that on Bitcoin because I, I don't understand enough, but I'm looking forward to all the Bitcoin content and crypto content Real Vision's putting out so I can learn more. My view on gold has been very simple. There will likely be a short-term pullback before there is a much bigger rally. The last thing he mentioned is bonds. And he said bonds aren't a home run to him as uh, Bitcoin and gold are. And the, probably the reason he said that is because, because bonds aren't a short-term play. I mean, sorry, they're not a long-term play. You, your bonds are not a macro play here. There's going to be a move down to probably zero or negative yields. And depending on where you are at in the bond space in terms of duration risk, the longer you're out, the more risk you take, but the bigger the move higher, you can you have certainly have an opportunity. Now, in my perspective, as a self-anointed bond king, as you see, whoops, right here, uh, I think bonds are layup trade where you can, you've got not only the Fed behind you, but the whole monetary system. You're seeing a contraction in credit. And when there's a contraction in credit, interest rates, well, they go down. So it's likely that we're going to see that move lower in interest rates and move higher in bond prices. And if you're not sure where you want to be, well, I look at it this way from my perspective. Let's say Rao's right and gold and Bitcoin take off and I feel like I missed the boat. Well, if I have a heavy bond position that's still going to go up, I can sell those bonds for a profit and still hop on the train. And I really haven't missed out on anything. Now, let's say that perhaps I'm right in the short term that Bitcoin and gold pull back and I want to buy them and bonds go up. Well, now I have more at my disposal when I sell those bonds to buy into those risk assets on the dip. Either perspective, you certainly can be a winner if you believe that he's going to be right and that I am going to be right as well. Well, I'm Steve Van Meter. Appreciate you joining me. I'd love to hear your feedback on this video. And as I said, we'll look forward to more content each week as we break down and try to explain how some of these advanced concepts can help you become a better investor and get more out of your Real Vision subscription. I'll see you soon. Bye now. If you like what you see on our YouTube channel, you can unlock everything that Real Vision has to offer from expert analysis, in-depth reports, education, and more to help you understand finance, business, and the global economy. You can get all that and more for just $1 for 30 days.